Welcome back to American Zarathustra. This is a very, very special episode today. Today we have somebody with us that is very hard to introduce, perhaps the most difficult guest I've ever had to try to introduce. So instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is kind of let him introduce himself through a video at his YouTube channel, and that's not the video. So I will start again and search for the video and be very graceful about it. Today we have my friend and an amazing artist and uh, songwriter, vlogger, blogger, all around amazing human being, a gentleman named Pill Eater. A Pill Eater, a lot of people say, well, what's up with that name, Pill Eater? And what's he all about? There's something crazy going on here. Well, you're very soon to find out. And um, I would say that the first thing I want to mention is that I, I started, I, I discovered Pill Eater, I think in, oh, I don't know, 2017, I would say. And he was the first white identitarian that I sort of discovered. And so I thought, wow, this is really cool stuff. And I'm just starting out with American Zarathustra, I'm kind of getting my, my bearings with that media. And so I did my first show with him, and that's in 2017. So this is really, really awesome to kind of come sort of full circle in 2021. And so without further ado, who is Pill Eater? Everybody, Everybody thinks, thinks Pill, Pill Eater is an idiot. idiot. No, no one, one takes him seriously. Everybody, Everybody thinks Pill Eater has a fascination with James Stewart that goes nowhere. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is weird for liking Mixkey. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is an anti-white Jew who wants to kill everyone. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is a loser who lives in his mom's basement or at Wendy's. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is a narcissist who's obsessed with YouTube and he's trying to get subscribers to get money. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is some kind of far-right neo-Nazi who doesn't have the intellect to understand Marxist or critical theory. Everybody thinks Pill Eater hates gays, and no way he would ever, he's, he's a self-hating gay. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is a traitor, and you shouldn't trust him. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is non-white. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is some school shooter. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is not talented. No way he can have a master's degree. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is Alex Gendler's neighbor who lives upstairs in Brooklyn. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is some fanboy who likes Mitski, Anna, and Akana, and a bunch of Asian girls he found on Google and now is completely obsessed with them in a weird school shooter kind of way. Everybody thinks Pill Eater should make more content on YouTube, yet YouTube censors everyone from the past two years and has Pill Eater has received over more than nine strikes and could lose any of this data at any second. That's why he uploads the bit shoot or just doesn't bother uploading new material anymore. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is just some chad that wants to abuse women and that's all he cares about is PUA and pickup artistry and having sex with as many people as possible. In no way would he ever want to settle down and get married and have children and live the healthy life, right? Everybody thinks Pill Eater hates everyone when in all actuality everybody Pill Eater has talked to hates Pill Eater. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is an untalented artist that won't get anywhere in life. He'll just be doing UPS seasonal work every year and make more music that nobody will listen to on Bandcamp whatsoever. Everybody thinks Pill Eater's art is completely useless. There's no value into his rambling writings or no value into his electronic music he produces or there is no value to any future painting he might do. Nobody likes that. There's more talented people out there, like one of Chicks Point Never. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is some Frank Castle fanboy until the last moment of Frank Castle will stalk Pill Eater because Pill Eater knows way too much about Sam Hyde and his gang. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is a hater when he's just under the influence of Jim Goder, Lydia Lunch, and the punk rock tradition that came from New York and LA. That's all full of hate. And now what you see is the remnants of countercurrents that everybody is a hater and whatnot. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is a sexual pervert who talks way too much about sexuality was trying very hard to be a John Gannett or part of that tradition, you know, male feminism and whatnot. Everybody thinks Pill Eater is just some fad that comes from the Manosphere movement and that Pill Eater is, comes from the Red Pill Blue Pill meme when now in actuality that was just a YTMD or the Mandal dog username that was made up in April something 2009. And that Pill Eater was well known that there he was a Pill Eater even before such Pill memes that existed or that has nothing to do with Pill memes whatsoever. Everybody thinks Pill Eater will just give up his YouTube career and make new alt accounts just like Ryan Falk does.
was. He probably has done that now. You can see his new YouTube channel at Francis Forever. Awesome. That's a pretty good introduction. I like it. I love it. I love it. I just realized I was muted and I said the most profound things. Um, so did you do the media on that as well, the, the video and music? <laughs> uh, it's actually a, a Mouse on Mars song. I, I remembered when I was 14 and I burnt it from the CD, the C CD single I had. And uh, cool, cool. I, I just wanted to do some visual. Actually, uh, if you have the singles album by New Order, it mm -hmm. talks to you about New Order being what new or new order is supposed to be and what not supposed to be. And uh, I was influenced by that template. I get and, it. I and, yeah. It's a funny indoor joke, but uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the video is really wicked. Cool. I don't know. I just something about the, the combination of the music and the whole thing. It has this kind of like weird pop art flavor to it. That's jarring and interesting. And, you know, you're kind of really trying to keep up with it. It's just very interesting stuff. So, wow, here we are again. Now, like I said, I, I discovered you in, I think, 2016, 17. And I, it, my first appearance on any show was on your show. Do you, uh, do you remember that? I do. I remember when, the, when YouTube before um, the, the lockdown began. And it, it was still a Silver Age, for sure. <laughs> yeah, well said. Um, you know, th we're talking 2017. My God, has uh, have things changed since then? You know, it's, uh, wow, I, I, I can't even imagine, you know, from that perspective, who I've become now and how much America has changed, the paradigms have changed, uh, the culture, the media, uh, politics. Um, wow, you know, it's pretty massive and it just seems to get more and more intense. Um, so, yeah, back then, I, American Zarathustra was a Facebook group. It was a Facebook page. And I actually showed my face on camera and, you know, did political commentary. People loved me because I was a, a supremely badass shitlord even back then. <laughs> and, you know, at Facebook, I don't think they had quite the, the mechanisms quite set up yet as they do today. And people were like, wow, man, this guy is, you know, speaking the truth and they wanted to get involved. And so I just did commentary videos. I started my my comics and online art of it, this, that, and the other thing, and then became American Zarathustra. But uh, tell me a little bit about the history of, of Pill Eater. Now, you, when did you start, and what, like, what did you go to school for? I, well, I went to school as an English major, but I also was an Asian studies minor, and I had many uh, disciplines I wanted to do, and I was mostly liberal arts, but just going around school for five years and then an additional two years at an actual art school to get my art journalist background, you could safely say I've been in academia for at least, you know, seven to yeah, about, about seven years or so. But um, mm -hmm. all around that time, when you have that much free time, you can do whatever you want and go online. And like you said, be a, be a shit Lord. Yeah. And yeah. not a shit lib. And do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, it's much better to be a shitlord. Um, so what's your relation to the arts and to the white identitarian sphere? The interesting part is that I didn't get into the far right activity until I was a teenager. And it was just <laughs> out of curiosity, uh, out of my own political science interest. And mm -hmm. it really began with just studying what the far right was about and one thing yeah. leads to another you're looking at radical stuff like it's a joke yeah. but then you actually discover more softer terms like you know like you said white identitarianism and whatnot and then one thing leads to another and now i, I find friends were into that i'm involved and less and less the whole shaming thing happens. You know, people are afraid to be associated with the far right because we live in such a, you know, clown world, liberal stuff. But once you understand that subculture, you start to know what you're doing is a completely moral and ethical cause. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, even in graduate school, the past two years, I had to remain silent and call myself as pronouns, he and him. 
mm. all the time. And that mm. gets to you a lot where uh, you have a space where you can express anti-liberalism, but you want to keep it avant-garde and artsy and almost like you want to try to tell people there are different realities and isn't so much a, a wig nat thing, but mm -hmm. let alone that there always has been anti-liberal, anti-modern forces. And I think that really has to do with the avant-garde. Uh, people will persuade you and say, no, it, it's, it's about social justice. It's about some weird egalitarian communism. But it's not exactly those points at all. It's about you as a person, as an egoist, trying to find your space. And, you know, uh, you know, people uh, have expressed themselves in many different ways. And the reason why I found that kind of far right space interesting is because it's pretty much the only anti-liberal kind of punk force happening, even mm -hmm. though it may take shape in different forms. You kind of have to divide yourself from the loonies into the just people. And it's kind of funny because so many of my opponents and friends love to call me as loony. And I have jokingly called it, oh, that's queer quote, quote unquote, as an indoor joke. But um, mm -hmm. the, the, the fun part of it all is just as long as you write about it and do your art and craft, uh, you could express yourself, uh, you know, just try to do what's morally right and ethically right. And, you know, I see myself as someone who wants to contribute to politics in a weird way and criticize liberalism. But I am never the type of person that you could just put in a little category and say, oh, that guy's racist or that guy's an idiot. That, that guy is Charles Manson or something. I'll only say those things just to be transgressive and to hurt the opponent. And mm. people like Frank Hassel and Sam Hyde already doing that. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so yeah, because I feel that people don't really understand you slash your art, like your persona and your your whole approach and it's it's actually very complex there's a huge amount of pop culture in it and you kind of overlap into other spheres that you're interested in uh such as asian arianism uh, which i think is a obviously everybody knows that you know i have my whole time in uh in asia where where i lived for five years and i sort of incorporate certain thoughts and ideas and you know philosophical perspectives into my conversations with people, although it, you know, it sort of throws people off there. There's, there's a, a natural knee jerk kind of like, well, that's not us, you know, kind of mentality and whatever, that's not really the subject of the show, but um, maybe you could kind of open up a little bit on some of the different things that you've done in terms of like your vlogging, your YouTubing, um, your artwork, your music, just to help the audience get to know you better. And then we're going to get into some topical things. And of course, uh, your review of the American Renaissance Conference. Yeah, um, the, the Pill Eater name was established on April 5th, 2009. I was a You're the Man Now dog user or YTMND.com. And this was a website that existed prior before memes and memes were called fads. And this is at the tail end of the aughts period. And as a young kid, I just wanted to make memes and kind of celebrate that fact. It was very apolitical at the time, but when I was yeah. 16, I was uploading, oh yeah, Mr. Crab stuff on YTMND.com. And there's a there's a YouTube channel by Know Your Meme that that actually cites Pill Eater as one of the innovators. Wow. Oh yeah. I, I even put it on my, my website too of all the how Pill Eater you can go back and from 2009 to 2011 that Pill Eater is cited as an early innovator. So I was highly into that alternative 4chan culture i wasn't a 4chan surfer but i was more into demo scene stuff uh and kind of computers and whatnot and i saw ytmd as an audio visual visual site i spent most of that time when i was an undergraduate but at that same time i was reading um you know julius evola and stuff like that and esoteric stuff but i kept yeah. most of that that stuff to myself and um i mm -hmm. always see myself as an artist Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until the end of 2016 when I was getting out of undergraduates was I on this obscure podcast called The Stark Truth with Robert Stark. By mm -hmm. the way, he's still going to this day, Robert Stark. And mm -hmm. that was just something I just wanted to reach out and be his co-host and help get stuff on. The, the whole Asian Arianism thing happened because as an Asian studies major, yeah. uh, it's kind of this knee-jerk reaction where – if you if you're saying this in 2016, you you look a few years later, 
there's no denial that China has a world power and it's kind of a global force happening. And yeah. the sad part of it all is all the anime we consume in and video games, that's all some type of Asian related and it's influencing our minds. And that could be a problem for such white nationalist, you know, scenes where it's, it's not that it's a good or a bad thing, but it's kind of being the outcome that if we kind of worship the Asian sphere, eventually there'll be this Eurasian Evolian master race that will take us over. And it's funny because some Wignats will hear that as a meme and it is meme worthy, but at the same time, it's actually a, a serious thing. I mean, the word was kind of made up of a joke in person with Al Stankard or Harlan Dennison back in 2016, but I, I kind of went with it and mm. kind of just use it as a brand name. But aside, aside from that, I've kind of moved on. I just talk about a lot of things, um, whether mm. that's, queer culture. And that was something in 2018 where I described that post unite the right failed is because the right became aware of subcultures and that what's worshipped now and even in the liberal arts is how if you're gay, black or trans or something and the same logic applies in white nationalism. <laughs> and that that can be an issue because we're it's it's why there's infighting so much and that being uh, downgraded to that superficial thing that's why you saw the nasbol vortex happening in 2019 and today where you now have this kind of anti-capitalist marxist force of keith woods mm -hmm. talking about yeah. but uh there's a lot right. to say and um being on the internet i kind of realized that i make data i make things what turns out yeah. to be just shit posts like you're looking at all my archives and i love it all data is data right these yeah. shit posts are more than that and they have value and people underlook people's shit posts you know right there once was a time where there were websites where people collected uh, Pepe memes and yeah. oh, here's my rare Pepe's I have. And right. this kind of, it's just glittering images and flashing images that pass us. Yet if we're super productive and make videos every day, whether it is Chris Chan or uh, some obscure locale of sorts, people express themselves in many different mediums and people will find your art no matter what. And it doesn't matter how good you are or bad you are. It's as long as you express yourself, you can learn more about yourself. And as you're scrolling my videos, I look how pretty the water tab marks are. And it's almost like video <laughs> diaries of what I was thinking at that it's time. It's amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel the same when I look at my own channel. I, oh, yeah, I remember when I was going through that or when that was the hot topic or this or that. I, and, I, I'm, um, I'm, I'm looking at, I'm, I'm seeing the beautiful wife of Randy Stare. That was a very controversial one where I tried to say that the Danny Phantom shooter was exploited and everybody hated me for that. And those little things, people yeah. will like say, oh, Pillier must be joking. I wasn't joking. I was just trying to think about what my thoughts were. They probably changed a bit, but the point of being is that, oh yeah, Randy Stare, it's sad that the white mm. youth out in Pennsylvania where I'm from have to suffer from falling in love with a fictional Danny Phantom character and then losing your mind and going haywire postal, you know, and it's sad right. that that happens. And I'm just saying it should be further investigated. Right, but yeah, right. Things like that. You look back and you're like, yeah, I got to save this. I got to get the transcripts. I got to put this in a book for future generations. I don't care who reads it, but it's important. Speaking of books, you've published a few books. Now you publish novels or tell us a little bit about your publishing experience. I have about eight publications. Okay. Um, the first one came out in 2016, but a lot of the early books were written when I, back in 2012, 2013, when I was much younger. But uh, mm -hmm. some of the first books came out, they're kind of by year. Almond Eyes, Baby Face was kind of just a, a, a White House, Peter Sotos type of book of sorts. And I kind of look back at it with funniness, like, uh, and then there was Trip, and that was kind of something I wrote when I was 23. And, and my friend was reading that to me the other day out loud, and I'm just like, I cringe at it being like, oh, yeah, I remember I wrote that. And, but I still love it. And then there was a time where I had Asianarianism.com, and that was getting traction. But mm -hmm. I had articles written for that, and I put it in a manifesto about stalking Patrick Highland. I look at that, and this is like, this is like an artsy weeb version of Carl Schmidt. You know, and then wow. I wrote a, I wrote a pamphlet for the Stark Truth with Robert Stark because I, I thought that podcast with Robert Stark was the most underlooked pre-recorded podcast right before Blood Sports, before you know, bro casting of Come Town and Red Scare and all that. And then I wrote some books about board games, about ludism, and about um, 
a Bob Black fake anarchist pamphlet called uh, Queer Culture. Which mm-hmm. I think I should, it needs a it's need, needs a big rewrite. But some of these some of these books are just standalones. And uh, the last two books, um, sixty second wipe out volume one, and it doesn't have to be like that. They're on Amazon, but th- those books are really interesting because they're more in zine style. Both of them are forty thousand words long and kind mm-hmm. of are in the same tradition, written like a punk zine mm-hmm. or a journal, but they have that kind of Twitter, Emil Saran type of witty Mm. epigraph stuff and Mm. that's what's interesting about twitter and things like that it's like unpublished twitter and you can just pick it up and read from weather and you know it's just been producing with the written word and see what you can write because sometimes you know the best work is not online and it's something you obtain physically and i think that's really special too It, it amazes me how culturally literate you are you People tend to kind of put themselves in little niches uh, according to the stuff they like, you know, but you have a really, really broad range uh, uh, and of aesthetics and or at least aesthetic sensibilities. And uh, I, th- I think it's pretty astonishing. And I think that it's something that people in the White Art Collective can learn from you know, and certainly should. Uh, there's, you know, there's a, a kind of a colossal artistic spirit here. And it seems like you're you're just sort of using every medium at your disposal to uh, to get your thoughts out, to express yourself. Um, and I'm not sure if there, like, what would you say is your kind of message or moral core or a certain uh, kind of path that you're on that, you know, really dis- distinguishes you a- among others? I mean, not to sound cliche, but it's like anti-liberalism, right? Okay. Okay. Anti-liberalism being we're associated in that scene and people would say the word dark enlightenment and mm-hmm. whether or how far you want to say that's some kind of, you know, depending how far you are on the right wing spectrum, we can all agree that some dark enlightenment or anti-liberalism basically means to mm-hmm. overthrow the establishment and change values. So mm-hmm. the good life is accomplished. It isn't so much living in decadence, but understanding decadence. Like it's okay to watch Larry Clark's kids or read Hubert Selby Jr. It's the point is to be straight edge, to be Christian, Mm. to Mm. have a religious foundation on that. And I see my art as not some, you know, people call me some like decadent guy doing whatever, but it's more on the fact that art is expressive and you can come from many different backgrounds and say whatever's on your mind and doesn't care what everybody, anybody thinks. Mm. And I say that the union, what's happening right now is that, and you can see this in the work of Sam Hyde and Frank Hassel, mm-hmm. is that they are against the system. And the real problem with the system isn't the patriarchy or whatever. It's it's actually this kind of globalist, evil capitalist system that sucks the soul out of the natural organic nation of people. And yeah. <laughs> whatever you want to take how far that is, I think by just, you know, reading Julius Evola or something like that, it could help people. But I'm not running a Julius Evola book club, but I am saying is that there are closed minded people and there will be leftoids. And I think it is okay to piss them off sometimes. And as for, you know, white people and white interest, that's okay too. Um, It's, Mm. it's, it's something to protect as well. It's just when you push someone, they will push back. And it's so as long as people demand they have an identity and say, I want this, I want that instead of being, you know, uh, pretending it's not there or living another day by the paycheck. And mm-hmm. as you ignore those things, the enemy will take you over. And that's mm-hmm. what I'm seeing right now. There's a lot of coward people out there. And mm-hmm. that's what needs, I think. And if any message for a white identity, a white identitarian politic, what has to be understood is that there's just some whites that don't want to, you know, stand up for themselves. And I think there's a pushing point where they have to speak up instead of just pretend it's not there. And I think that requires a lot of criticism and a lot of red pilling for sure. Mm-hmm. So anti-liberalism is the the thread that goes through all your your different art, video, music, uh, books that you author, and etc. Do you um, maybe talk a little bit about your music as well? And I, I'd like to maybe end the show with one of your songs. There's a, a funny song, <laughs> "Mox Out Communists," that I I really like, and we'll, we'll play that at the end of the show. But um, how do you make music? What's your music all about? Um, well, actually, it's funny because my my brother is, an, is a musician. And when I was really young, 
I was told to play guitar at 14 and originally I was supposed to go to Berkeley school of music. And wow. uh, yeah, yeah. They, they, my family taught me to play sitar and sitar. Wow, cool. where I had a callus on my finger and my, my mm. sitar teacher, he was in a, a movie. Um, I won't mention his name, but he was a really great guy. He lives in the neighborhood and um, I was into Indian music and I was trying to get into Berkeley, but it just wasn't my thing. Mm-hmm. And I decided to do Asian studies instead. And this is like more than 14 years ago. Yeah. So just learning a keyboard and whatnot at, at that young age, you, as long as I can remember, I think I was 15 into mouse on Mars and elect- weird electronic music and like Aphex twin mm-hmm. and things like that. And one yeah. thing leads to another. And uh, I'm in, I'm in my, my, well, my little office room right now and it's a bunch of board games and synthesizers in here. Um, and so I kind of just work on that discipline alone and, it's mainly a family influence, but uh, I've been, I, I work with electronic music and all that. And recently it was about, it was about a decade ago. I did a, a chip tune release and it was called TJ Quato. And that was like a seven inch. And back then when you had MySpace music, mm-hmm. uh, I was only 17 at the time that did pretty well, but I had to take a break from music and music was just a hobby. And it wasn't until midway and undergraduate did i pick it up again and went on the vaporwave craze and i had a, i had a tape that sold pretty well and uh george george clanton who is a vaporwave musician he he got that tape and he said i absolutely love it would you open up for me for 100 percent electronic in brooklyn and i said oh, i couldn't because uh i was in graduate school but uh a lot of those little connections you know is interesting for sure and going to those shows and concerts are interesting but now um I've been I've been messing with um oh I have I have a few music releases and they can all be seen on Chom Charity uh music link tree or just my link tree and you could probably find some or just search a Dishog's name of uh, uh the Fieven Universe name and you'll see all that that stuff linked yeah. or even my Bandcamp yeah. but uh, yeah the your link tree by the way is in the show notes of this so for anybody would like and it's enormous <laughs> it's amazing you just keep it's a little, scrolling it's a little I had to make a second link tree just for my oh. music. Good God. That's, yeah, I'm getting, so I'm getting addicted to the link tree stuff. I might even make okay. a third one. Right. So under another name, right? Like how many names do you have? Well, um, we have a really, really exciting show today. I'm extremely happy to have everybody in the chat. If you could all please uh, share the show in your networks as well. Uh, Pill Eater is really somebody who's, I, I think, not well understood and, and somebody who can bring so much more dimension to the the white identity white identitarian sphere i want to ask you are, are are you connected to the white art collective at all or what are your thoughts on the white art collective i actually enjoy white art collective and i remember when they first came on the scene i was in the chat whenever they had live streams for that and i often was commenting and whatnot and i i do like the music a lot um mm-hmm. i remember one act was called dystopian park i, I don't even know what happened with that it was just a little mm-hmm. electronic act that sounded like early joy electric nice. <laughs> and yet 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 oh, uh, well, well a lot of that is interesting because um you know I, I love your art that you're contributing to it as well and uh mm-hmm. i like that whole whole scene what they're what they're trying to do um yeah i mean, I, I mean i'm not personal with the guys but uh I do like what's being put out and uh, it's kind of, rem- I mean, if you want my music criticism right now, I remember when I was a teenager, there was an obscure website called mice trap distribution. And it was some like neo Nazi skinhead stuff out of New Jersey. Yeah. And they would sell like the most brutal uh, rock against communism stuff. Mm. And this was during a time when I was listening to like power electronics and metal. And it was just this immature kind of like racist type of stuff. But mm. if you look at it, you know, the whole that that spectrum is kind of almost a joke if you look at it in the past. And I'm not associating anything with that scene, but it, it always remind me that white arts collective. I mean, especially you don't want to be associated with that type of um, mm. extremeness that M- Mice Trap distribution has had in the past. And I, I've seen now there's more clarity, definitely with, you know, this post uh, identitarian scene that is happening and isn't so much the, uh, you know, classical uh be a white supremacist you know 1488 stuff yeah. yeah but that was mice trap like years ago but I, I i remember being nostalgic for that transgression the transgression's kind of going out i just fear that transgression coming out because you know what they say right bad optics whatever yeah, yeah. larping as a hollywood nazi type all the classic you know metapedia definitions and all yeah, yeah, but yeah. uh no I, I i think white arts collective is is definitely onto something if it's more about 
being white and mm-hmm. that expression alone. But I, I can't speak for them at all. But I do like their magazines they are putting out. Mm, okay. So we're, the White Art Collective is associated with White People's Press, White People's Quarterly. Um, I It's funny. I guess I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here because you, you're going to be reviewing the uh, recent American Renaissance Conference. And you saw my art for sale there. <laughs> so um, I wanted to just mention that I spoke to the editor of White People's Press today about uh, basically selling my art through his site. So people could buy prints, posters, even like, you know, T-shirts or mugs. I don't know. We haven't figured that out quite yet, but I'm excited about having more of my art out there for, for sale, basically. Um, but uh, so... Yeah, it's, this is exciting. There's a lot to talk about, but you know, let's let's just talk a little bit about some topical things. What's going on right now? Now, what was your response to the verdict of Kyle Rittenhouse being not guilty today? I was relieved because, um, yeah, blowing up in my secret, super secret Telegram chat, uh, yeah. everybody yeah. was saying it's not guilty, not yeah. guilty, and I remember texting, "Oh, come on, drum roll," and then. Yeah, not guilty, and I'm just kind of relieved. And it reminds me of the same relieved when Donald Trump won the election, where at mm. least people have common sense, and at least there is some type of. Because I thought the whole thing was a kangaroo case to make mm. him look bad and to shun us, but at yeah. least there's common sense, and you can defend against yourself if you know they're not just peaceful protests; they're they're a violent riot that's happening. Right, right. I I mean I I, I follow a lot of these court cases right now. Um, Charlottesville is is going on right now um, with Cantwell and, and Spencer, and it's uh, I'm following the reports on it through Telegram because, of course, Telegram seems to be the kind of the place to go as far as finding channels that are actually honest about you know uh, white identitarian news and this kind of thing, and you get very intelligent takes. Uh, the Western Chauvinist is an excellent channel. Um, anyway, are, are you familiar at all with what's going on with the, with the Seville uh, case? Um, my friends will text it on and on. Uh, okay. uh, Tiger Jin and Augusta Soul Invictus over mm-hmm. at their channel are giving mm-hmm. you know reports on what's what's happening and what they're saying in court. It is very interesting. Um, now I was I was there at Unite the Right, and I was I guess I was kind of a bystander, even though I was right in the center of all that action happening. You mm-hmm. know. I um I think it's a very strange case for sure and I always feel like you know I'm not a lawyer but yeah. it seems like they you know there are some people who were super invested into <clears throat> activism and being open and now some of those kids are in court in the Charlottesville scene trying to be witnesses or whatnot and uh I don't know I I feel bad you know it, it's kind of like I hope the best can happen and that people can have some kind of mercy. I, I wouldn't, again, I'm not read up on what is actually happening in court. My, again, Tiger mm-hmm. Jin and Gustafson Sol Invictus talk about a lot, but yeah. uh, I just hope for the best. Um, you know, when I was there, I just peacefully there. I went in, I went out, you know, I didn't cause, I didn't fight or anything or that I got away from danger, but for the people, I guess, you know, you're inciting violence or is it some Fetty setup? It goes many okay. different ways and many different. Uh, it's very much a Fetty. Yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, very much a Fetty setup. Uh, uh, Catwell, I guess, is destroying the uh, the other side. And I, I'm just sort of following it. But, you know, how, what it usually boils down to is the, the, the judge and the jury and the lawyers are all on the other side. And it's, you know, there's no way to win cases. No matter how honest and truthful and clever and what data and evidence you have, Somehow or other, they'll they just all conspire against you, so that it's a joke. But um, that's another topic. Anyway, so here we are. We have we're, I'm having you on the show to tell us about uh, this year's American Renaissance Conference. Uh, I'll, I'll put that up on the screen. Tell us about the experience. I I actually I planned to go this year. <laughs> um, I, I did my research, uh, flights, and this and that, and you know hotels and and I got all excited about it. There were some choices I had to make and I I felt like, you know, maybe next year. That's I I felt kind of sad about it. But I had some people ask me, you know, 
could we uh, sell your work at the at the conference? And I'm like, God, yes, you know. So I, I prepared my artwork and prints and etc. And so you saw it there, which is good. I'm really happy. I'm hoping that some people at the American uh, Renaissance Conference are enjoying my artwork now. But uh, let's, yeah, walk me through it, man. What was it like? I'm really excited to go sometime. This is my was my second American Renaissance. My first okay. one was in 2017. Mm -hmm. I got my tickets in May, coming from Philadelphia to Nashville. I got in uh, to Thursday night and Ubered there on that Friday afternoon. Uh, okay. Great park, Montgomery uh, State Park. It's a great place, the lodge. Mm -hmm. uh, but this year you had to... Um, you had to go through two police uh, security services just to show your name, uh, pat you down. That's kind of a first time, if I recall. Um, it's it's a great environment it, because a lot of the best minds, and yeah. if you wanted to call race realism, it's specifically in that category, but as well as, I would say, far-right activism, show yeah. up in suit and tie. And kind of there's this old school tradition there that's still there. And there's some familiar faces. And I want to take a shout out to Dave, who this is the second time I've met in person. And he, I guess he was showing up every year. And, uh, you know, he, he's not online or anything like that, but he's a consumer of this stuff. And mm -hmm. uh, it's great. I met him and we met and I had a farewell with him, too, at the Nashville airport. Great guy, by the way. But um, Friday night, the cheese and the wine, that's all great, you know. <laughs> Uh, always the Friday is the best, right? And then when you get to your, you know, always I would strongly suggest to get your hotel at the lodge because you want to be in that hall and of wake course. up. You sure. know, you know, I, a lot, the first time I did it, I was on an Airbnb 20 minutes away, but better, better, so much better to be in the, the hotel. But anyway, a uh, huge day on that Saturday, I'm just nine o'clock sharp and great speakers. I, I love hearing F. Roger Devlin. Um, the first time I met him was at a countercurrence event back in Philadelphia when Sexual Utopian Power came out and his speech on Envy, which is now up on a transcript now, just today on Emran.com. Uh, I hopefully the videos will be up soon, but uh, his speech on Envy is a really good articulate one. I always think Devlin has something great to say. Um, mm -hmm. what, what I also love about these speeches as well is that there's always coffee break, and between coffee break is very important because when you're just Mingling and socializing, the most important part, I think. Um, mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how many people are in the internet scene and just know, oh, I know you. I know you that. And there's a yeah. lot of first-time meets. And I was That's... able to make six contacts on Telegram. That's got to be so cool. Yeah, And I got thing. five of those guys in my Telegram chat now. And now mm -hmm. I have a little scene going on there. <laughs> cool, and cool. Uh, all had to do with just a single Saturday because, oh, mm -hmm. are you – are because I went by a, I went by a fake name, G Gavin Hadaway, and they asked, "Are you? Are you? So your name's Gavin? Well, actually, my name's Pilliter. Oh, mm. hey, you, uh, you had that, and they'll always will say something about me or something, and then mm -hmm. I just say, "Hey, join, join the Telegram, whatever." And that's the most important part about this thing, especially right. with the coffee breaks, by the way. Sure, um, sure, yeah. A lot of great speeches. Um, Michelle Malkin, whatever your opinion on her is, mm -hmm. um, first time seeing her. She has a very interesting speech about um, tiger moms and rooftop Koreans going against the open border blacks, which I think is uh, very mm -hmm. controversial, especially being part of conservative Inc. And now you're saying that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Prio Brimlo, the, the casual classic stuff, you're always saying what to expect next year, always mm -hmm. like what he has to say. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, this year there was no uh, David Cole. Uh, good guy who wrote Republican Party Animal and uh, Colin Flattery. They both had a sickness. It wasn't because they bailed. They were both sick. That's and it's, un it's understandable. And uh, yeah. I yeah. mean, I've met David Cole in L.A. before with Robert and Matt and that whole gang with Luke Ford. And <laughs> I just I want, to see him. I want to see Dave again, but you can't win everything, right? Um, Could you expand a little bit on Michelle Malkin's speech and, and what – that because there's obviously going to be a lot of pushback from certain people in our sphere. And, it, you know, I don't know if, if there's anything you can say that can bridge uh, her presence at Amren with those people and their views or, you know, I don't know. I just want to kind of give a, give that a run over. Well, this is my first time listening to Michelle Malkin. I know I've heard the name drop so many times on Amren, 
But this reminds me of a one time when Gregory Hood tried to get Peter Thiel into the countercurrent scene, and that didn't far go so well because then SPLC did a hit piece on them, and I felt bad. But mm. you know, Malkin, you know, book topics on open borders, whatever. This is classic Reuper material. It's basically yeah. infighting within conservative ink to try mm -hmm. to push it into that intersectional far right stuff. And yeah. whatever you think that there's some uh, political correctness or civic nationalism happening in the scene, I think it's more on the type of, uh, I mean, it's not just diplomacy, but it's more on par with people agreeing with certain issues. And uh, some people, you know, will say, oh, it has to be more out there. You have to be more wignatty and stuff like that. But I think Emren in the past, and I was just about to say this, you know, David Cole being Jewish and, yeah. you know, all doing the most, but he was a Holocaust denier. You know, he's a Holocaust revisionist. Right, you know, right. he, he knows he's in that transgressive pseudo punk scene. And that's kind of mm -hmm. whether your opinion on Jewish behavior is what it, whatever it is. The point yeah. being is that at least Malkin can give a voice at Emren and then justify, you know, it makes a little, it makes everybody a little bit normal and it makes, mm -hmm. the thing. I think it's more of a groiper force coming in to make people more. Right. If I can share my thoughts on this. So yeah, sure. my, my view of identity politics is, is a huge spectrum. I, I don't know how to ex express this, but basically, yeah, I know where I am on that spectrum. I know who my people are and, and I have my, ideological roots, et cetera. But, and, and I look at this in terms of, you know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, um, that people like Michelle Malkin are, and the Groyper scene, et cetera, can act as a gateway uh, to where we are, or, you know, and, and even maybe beyond. And, and so, what when I see the kind of these kind of hardcore wignat kind of guys mock it out or something, I really feel like you know you guys are not really seeing opportunity here. You have to see this as opportunity. Um, you know, I don't know. A couple of years ago, we didn't. You know, we were even more ghettoized than we are now. But people like her in in this particular position, etc., are moving the Overton window, and for her to appear. Think of it from like a, a midwit normie perspective. Oh my God, Michelle Malkin spoke at a white nationalist conference. You know, <laughs> that's how they're going to look at it. So they're going to kind of say, why would she do that? What did she say? What is it really? What What's going on? And and it just kind of softens up the, the, the path. It kind of greases the slide and it allows people to start to come into our sphere and look at, our ideas and, and that's it. So, you know, I don't think that she's, I don't know how she could go full, you know, hardcore right wing or what have you, or that she even should. I don't know that that's necessary. I think it's okay that there is a spectrum, you know, but at the same time, you know, I, I'm kind of seeing it in terms of like, how can we leverage this, you know, in, in to our benefit. And I don't mean that in an underhanded, sneaky sort of way. I would love to have Michelle Malkin on the show and say, hey, what did, what did you talk about? Well, my only concern is there's still people in the scene that say, you know, Emren is not hardcore enough. And mm -hmm. I've talked about, so and you see this in white nationalist circles where it's Perfect. like, well, there's always some pock person. It, it can't be full on white national, you know, and it's always some purity spiraling happening. Yes, yes, like yes, the yes. little stuff. And that's where you have the, the, the little sex happen where there, I bet you there's probably older millennials who think Michelle Malkin is too uh, paused and that makes Emren bad. And Emren is there for conservative stuff or something. But you have to understand the bigger picture here that Emren has been around since 94 and has been. And Emren has always the scene was totally different from 2017, where you had yeah. just the Trump train and just. Yeah party goers and drug guys, all yeah. that in the classic Emran. You had Spencer yeah. and Johnson and yeah. Freiburg and Dragani in the same room in 2017. Yeah, yeah it's wild. And it's that's pretty wild. Over, you know, yeah. I think, I, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about it later, but, you know, Emran has cleaned image. You know, mm -hmm. you want to say Malkin is making Emran not hardcore enough, but the thing is, Emran's starting over again, and mm -hmm. it's a good thing, too. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, I guess that's just my, my angle and my statement to the 
uh, these guys on our side that are, are very rigid about this is that, you know, play the game, you know, look at politics like a chessboard, see who, you know, who can you work with? How can we, because we're not going to flip a switch and then the Western world is going to be 100% white. You know, there's still going to be people of color living with us, uh, Native Americans and uh, biracial people, etc. We have to find some kind of way in which they're actually working to protect us rather than to destroy us. That's literally the opposite of the communist approach. You know, the communists uh, weaponize people of color rather than, you know, whereas we could be talking to them saying every single thing you enjoy and own and and all these freedoms and, and medicine and education and technology is from us. And why would you not? protect that right if you know china goes into tibet and invades and and you know slaughters the people and exiles them and genocides them then it's no longer tibet right so why would you want to be a part of something like that because when whites are gone if whites ever are gone then america is gone and everything you know and cherish and value is gone and even a part of you is gone so i, I feel like you know, there's going to be people that mock me for saying that, but I feel like that that mentality is sort of like a, a gym room, uh, you know, sort of like uh, check out my muscles kind of mentality. It's like we have to think broader than just like who's who's tougher than the next guy who's being more based. You know, that, that's very uh, kind of high school mentality to, from my perspective. But yeah. anyway, how about some other people? What uh, how was Jared Taylor's? Jared Jared was a uh, great too. I think, um, you know, it's always great hearing Jared Taylor. And the one thing I have to tell people about Emran is that you got to remember that Jared Taylor, Peter Brimlow and Sam Dixon, they're not going to be around forever. They're, they're right. getting pretty old. And I know. I know. Some of these guys, you know, next 10 years, they might just give up and then we won't have an Emran anymore. So I strongly suggest everyone to attend Emran next year and at least give Jared Taylor a handshake, a hug, talk My to God. him. My God, yeah. Tell him you're on his side and listen to his speech in person. Cause I started to realize how important Taylor's speech is. And Taylor always jokes and says, I've been saying the same stuff every year. And uh, <laughs> know, but it, it, he does a humor stuff too, but it's been getting yeah. really dramatic where I'm, you know, starting since the last two years ago, Taylor usually ends on a sad note and it's always sad to see uh, Taylor have a tear. You know, and he cries mm -hmm. up, you know, giving yeah. this dramatics. And I, I just realized how Taylor is so passionate yeah. with what he's doing. And this whole organization is his, is that he's doing yeah. this for us. Yeah. And in a way, you know, Taylor is something we definitely should, um, you know, we should at least buy one of his books, you know, and yeah. uh, he's a yeah. great guy. And I love his mustache, too. This, you know, <laughs> I know, I'm, I'm, I, It's like, uh oh, we're getting serious now when Jared Taylor's got a mustache. You know, this in is person, just... he's got a really, you know, he, on, online, he's considered to be an Ivy League, you know, intellect. But in person, he's a he's a very funny guy. Very a I, lot of things you never know about him in person. I, I think he's extraordinary. I mean, he speaks fluent Japanese and French. Um, do not challenge him to a push-up con uh, contest as well. I mean, he's, Uncle Jared uh, will kill you on that. Um, but yeah, I mean, he's the grandfather of us all in a way. I mean, at least, you know, people who came in and say like, you know, the Trump era and that, because prior to that happening and that, that kind of era, it seemed like that was, I don't know, it was just off most people's radars. They, the idea of like white identity and all of these things wasn't, it's not mainstream, but uh, I don't know. It's, it's, I guess, you know, to you and I, this is our mainstream, you know, this is what's normal to us. This is the, you know, how, how many books and speeches and interviews and, you know, content that have we, I think I've seen every single Amran Jared Taylor video that I could consume, you know, as I was like coming up and in, into this, uh, Google has shadow work. banned Jared Taylor. It's, it's Google. The first thing Google did when they shadow banned videos back yeah. in 2018 is they got rid of his old school videos on YouTube and they shadow banned searching his name on, uh, YouTube. And it's impossible to find, 
an American Renaissance speech or a Jared Taylor interview on YouTube and all that stuff's been gone because Google knows how powerful he is. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a testament to what he is and what he's done. Um, but at the same time, it's, you know, infuriating and infuriating. Sorry, it makes you mad to uh, see what they did. You can find his work on Odyssey now, like Odyssey is the place. So like, if you want to shit post or you want to get people connected to Amren, um, which I do frequently as a part of my online activism. Uh, you know, I, I, I'll send Amren videos to normies and conservatives and Trumpers and all that. And, you know, again, like get out of the, the mental ghetto, the mental echo chamber of like, you know, let's all just kind of flex our muscles and, you know, uh, you know, kind of flex to each other about how tough and cool we are. Get out there and change the damn world. Like all this bullshit about, hey, I'm cooler and tough and I've got extreme views. That means shit if you're not out there fighting in the war. And so this is Jared Taylor's videos are probably one of the best means to get this across. I cannot tell you how many times I've, I've engaged in like info war on, say, YouTube or rather uh, Facebook. And I'll, I'll post some Jared Taylor speeches. And the, whoever I'm fighting, you know, that, you know, that lefties, are, they're never going to change. They just do the same bullshit. And then in the end, they just insult you, you know, like uh, insults are not arguments kind of thing. But for the 50 people that were reading the thread and watching, those are the people that you're touching. Those are the people that you're exposing to new information and saying, oh, wow, there's a whole academic sphere of scientific study and data gathered up over decades you know, and all housed in this wonderful place called American Renaissance. And that will always be there. That's kind of like the foundation of our temple in some way. And, you know, again, it's just I, I don't like to see people disrespect Jared Taylor and American Renaissance, regardless of, you know, like, oh, it's Boomer or some crap. Like, cut it out. Have a little respect. These guys forged the path that got you where you are now. You know, so that's kind of my attitude about that. But let's uh, let's continue. What? Uh, who else was at the uh, at the conference? Well, instead of uh, Taylor, we also had Colin Flattery's um, mm. uh, podcast singer. He showed off some songs because Flattery was not there. Very, very cl uh, Alan the Barbershop guy. Yeah, he uh, he actually gave me one of his albums for free. Uh, I liked okay. his music. It's just when he was playing the video collage, I thought it was so disturbing about how. You know, the, the like, don't let the black kids get you mad. Where they were showing clips of blacks attacking whites, and he was supposed no. to be making it humorous. And then it is funny to laugh and some of the conundrums, but then it's like, well, it's all this non white violence on whites. It's just so, it's too much. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's hard um, to watch. But, it, but it's hard to watch, but you learn about it. And I think yeah. that's the point of flattery in Alan. It, it, oh, God, good, yeah. People, yeah. good people. But yeah. um, afterwards, there was a debate because there was no uh, Dave Colt. It was uh, Jared Taylor and Gregory Hood versus um, Sam Dixon. And I forget the other guy. I don't know if it was Chris Roberts or something. Uh, he he works at MREN, but they had a debate together. Questions, pro-Trump, anti-Trump, ethno-state, anti-ethno-state, politics yeah. and stuff. Very quick. Uh, hopefully that will be online as well. Mm -hmm. Then the dinner happened. And dinner's great. Steak, more wine. More mashed potatoes, more apple pie. Love, <laughs> love the dinner. Everyone should buy the dinner if considering. Go to the banquet. Banquet's very important. Do not go out the lodge and gather food or whatever. Go to the banquet because yeah. you get to the little table. You meet nine new people, and you just talk and relaxing. And uh, Gregory Hood spoke during the banquet, and I think the Gregory Hood speech was a very fiery speech, wow. and probably one of the highlights of this Emran because. Uh, especially during the part where Hood made people think about, you know, the Kyle Rittenhouse case for a second. And yeah. uh, I was kind of that scene too. People were just standing up, clapping, screaming. Probably the most loudest part at MREN came with Hood's, um, you know, climax of this is all about whether Rittenhouse gets in or gets off point is this is a war on whites and it was just very huge energy in the room and uh, mm. that was like my favorite part awesome. and it, it, it's great because today hearing that um rittenhouse is not guilty it's you know it's great it's very um 
Um, I've been so excited all day yeah. about that. I, I really was just over the top, over the moon, you know, so happy about that. Been following it very closely. Clearly, everybody understands how important the, the case is to America, but obviously to whites. You know, this is a it's a it's really a pivotal point. And I'd say, like, we need to capitalize on that. You know that the left would capitalize like crazy had he lost. Supposedly, say, okay. I'm invited to a Twitter space later, like tonight at midnight, where they want to have a, a written house celebration. Nice. <laughs> and, uh, but then I look on my Twitter spaces and you see the scoring leftist being uh Rittenhouse did murder. And it's the same suspects over again. Very yeah. weak, liberal minded mm -hmm. people who don't see the light. And uh, but I the, the news is, you know, common sense. Right. Yeah. You know, Second Amendment, you know, but that's yeah. but hood is prophetic in the way that that energy, that force, that prayer, that belief gets yeah. across. Rittenhouse is off. There is hope for mm -hmm. saving you know white america all that and that's what hood was getting across and that's that's a good thing so the energy is there just hidden yeah and again we need to be able to read the signs and capitalize on it we should be planning well how do we use this you know let's what kind of meme war do we want to get into how can we create more media on this topic how can we get that media in front of our people more you know how can we leverage this uh, legally and 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 show that okay according to this case you know that sets a precedent for these other things again like had he lost you know the 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 lawyers the jewish lawyers would be coming out of the woodwork you know and, and that they you know that would have they would have like over overrun so much more of what we what we are and what we do so it, it's i just can't overemphasize like what an important case this is um how was sam dixon's speech yeah, I well, the one thing which is really important is after Hood is you got to remember their Saturday night parties too. And <laughs> okay. What, what's like an Amron, okay, what's an Amron party like? Come okay, on. so there's two Let's, two special nights. There's yeah. the Friday, and the key mm. is you want to get there as soon as possible. I would say noon on Friday to the lodge. That's okay. my mistake I made, but you want to get there on Friday. But Saturday, when you have all the speeches right after dinner. Everyone goes to the cabin across the river, and that's the very special place is the cabin hangout. And okay. the cabin hangout, I think, is a very underground ritual annual thing that everyone should do. And the cabin is super nice because you have a fire, there's a full moon out, you're in a whole room with every other people are just, you know, had families with their kids, their dogs, you know. Right. And just uh, in the, the little room with a sofa and you can just sit down. I met more people and talking about Savitri Davy and Julius Evel and all that right. esoteric stuff. I have this. See, I'm, I'm super one in the morning, right? Yeah, I'm, I'm very, very much into the esoteric stuff for sure. And that's um, what I, I was from like nine till 1230. One in the morning was I talking to brand new friends. Uh, Ian mm -hmm. who's down the telegram. I've been meaning to follow up on him. Mm -hmm. Great God. And you'll meet these kids who are like, have you heard of Miguel Serrano? And I'm like, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Nice. Very nice. And then we're just going on. And it's there's a little late. So the hobbyists can find the room. And that 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 scene, that cabin scene, beautiful. Um, and oh, it looks gorgeous. Just, just, if you're going to Emran, definitely go to the cabin when it turns dark. And that's when this, mm -hmm. the, the amazing things happen. But then afterward, once you go to bed, get back at one in the morning, sleep for six, seven hours, wake up starting at seven, nine. Then you have uh, Dixon and, uh, oh, I can't pronounce his name, the Estonian guy. I just always butcher his name, Ruben. Yeah. Ruben, uh, I I'm so, apologize so much. I I've seen him speak at Amra, and I know who you're referring to. He's Ruben, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry for butchering his name, but he, I, like, he wasn't there because what I liked about him is he didn't want to take a vax. And he couldn't come in our country. And so he just made a video cast. And the video yeah. cast, really cool, funny, good he's still active, and nice good job. he has values. Love what he does. And he's showing Estonian nationalism is here, still alive. Good stuff. Wow. Now, now Dixon, Dixon usually concludes the event. And this is right before noon. And Dixon, I was, ta I was talking to Dixon the day before because my friend Tiger Jin is really good friends with Dixon. And Dixon remembers me too in 2017 as my, my other associate is Doug Huntington mm. and uh, he's good friends and we are able to text each other too. He has my text contact as well. And mm. it's funny because 
once you talk to Sam Dixon in person, he's a very open-minded guy. He knows very well educated. And uh, mm-hmm. the funny part was uh, when we were talking in a group uh, on Saturday or yeah, it was about Saturday or Friday. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Around that time, uh, both Saturday, Friday, um, I, I talked to him about, you know, how, you know, the state's kind of against us. And yep. it's kind of bizarre that Joe Biden says Antifa is an ideal. And uh, that our own president is saying Antifa is just an ideal, but we're like some political terrorist squad. Well, the, the next day in his speech, uh, I, I think this is just pure coincidence. But he, he in the middle of speech is like, remember, this is what Joe Biden said. Antifa is just an ideal. And I was like, <laughs> huh, I wonder if Dixon got that from me. I mean, not to sound selfish or anything, but it's just funny. I think it's just total coincidence. But it just shows you how significant and telepathic that well, is. It's here's like, another fascinating thing. I just caught in the news uh, today uh, before the show that somebody asked uh, fake President uh, Brandon, what do you think about the Kyle Rittenhouse not guilty? And, and, and he said, well, I have to follow what the court says. We have a good court system. And so whatever they decided, I go along with. And I'm wondering if he even knows who Kyle Rittenhouse is. You know, just for starters, um, like had he been on message and on script, you know, he would have uh, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, of course, there's uh, there's other people out there now that are saying, oh, no, we have to take it to federal court. But um, still, this is a beautiful, beautiful moment for our country and our people. And I, I'm, I, I let's just enjoy it. Let's celebrate it and enjoy it. And then let's take that energy and push it in a good, strong way and, and you know, take the momentum in, into our activism, into our the health of our culture and our people. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Um, was there anything else you wanted to share about the conference before I play some of your music for the outro? Yes, very important thought. Well, everyone has to disperse before noon. Hmm. Uh, keep in mind that if you take an Uber into the park, you can't Uber out of the park. You can Uber Ooh. in, but you can't Uber out simply because there's no reception. So be sure if you go to American Renaissance next year, that if you do Uber in or you come in, make sure you have friends to drive you out of the park or at least (laughs) get out there and get Uber reception and burns and then go. But I would say if you Uber in to the park, make sure someone can drive you to the airport. I was lucky enough for my friend Tiger to drive me to the airport. And I I thank him so much for that, especially when when we had to disperse, Jared was saying, keep in mind, there is one Antifa among us who's taking pictures. So beware if you go out in the hallway. And uh, wow. with that stress in mind, I'm just like, oh, who's who? Who's the rat among us? Wow. Wow. <laughs> and, that's that's uh, I, I didn't know who it was, but uh, that definitely gets you obnoxious and trying to get an Uber back and then complaining. And that's like, OK, good. Tiger got me out by uh, noon. And I was okay. able to catch my six o'clock flight, but it's uh, mm-hmm, just mm-hmm. something to make sure about. And great people, just make sure when everyone disperse, make sure to shake everyone's hand and everybody has a good time and all that, you know. Nice, nice. Wow, yeah. man. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing more shows with you or uh, talking to you more, thinking through what kind of content that we're doing, what culture we're building. Um, I'm going to need to have you on Imperium Art, actually. <laughs> I'm kind of pushing you into this on the show here. Um, Absolutely. We'll, we'll have to, yeah, we'll talk about that later. But uh, let's let's close out with some of your music here. Uh, tell us about this song, I Am the Communist. That was written on a Moog Prodigy, a vintage Moog Prodigy, which I rented for some time. And a lot on that Anna Akana album is kind of in tune with the the six calm death and June neo folk thing, but it was more on tune of this avant-garde Devo synth pop stuff. But well, I am the communist is a playful song about people who think they're communist, but it's very yeah. poetic for sure. But it's mostly a mood prodigy, what you're hearing and a vocoder. It's, it took me a minute. I'm like, why is he making a, a pro communist? And then I realized you're mocking out communists, you know? And, uh, and then I started just laughing my head off. So, um, well, let me thank you so much for coming on the show. I want to thank everybody in the chat for the interesting conversation, for sharing this link. Uh, as always, you know, it's, it's you, the audience, that is more important because you have to get this message out. Share this show and, and my other shows and Pill Eater shows in your networks 
so that we can share our culture, grow our culture, and have a lively and, and engaging culture. Uh, and you're you're about to engage in some really cool music in a second here. Uh, any closing thoughts, Pilater? Uh those albums are great. Some of that digital only stuff. I, I kind of just wish I published the Anaconda stuff on vinyl if I had the money, but uh, mm. some of these great demos that I have definitely would love to reissue this on like cassette tape or something. Some of these tracks is cool. the Anaconda little release is a favorite of mine. I just wish I put more money into exposure for that one, but uh, okay. definitely love the very nostalgic about the Moog Prodigy I recorded on that album with. So Good stuff. And where can people find you? If you just go www.pilleater.com or youtube.com slash pilleater, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of links there. I would suggest going by the link tree and discovering my books and music and all that. Right. Link my in... link tree will have everything. But right. uh, link, tree, link tree's in the show notes below this video. So, All right. Once again, thank you so much for joining me. I look forward to talking more in the future. Thanks again to everybody for joining me on American Zarathustra. We'll see you on the internet. And Thank you. God bless Kyle Rittenhouse. I am the communist.